OpenAI kickstarted the artificial intelligence arms race with the explosive debut of ChatGPT in late 2022, turning the startup into a $300 billion company and founder Sam Altman into a household name. Joining us right now is tech journalist Karen Howe, whose latest book is out today. It's called Empire of AI, Dreams and Nightmares in Sam Altman's OpenAI. The book is a culmination of over 300 interviews conducted over the last seven years. Karen, thanks a lot for coming in today. Thank you so much for having me. Congratulations on the book. Thank you. Um, you were writing about OpenAI before anybody had any idea what this was. Your, your first That's right. kind of take on them was 2019. How did you find them and what did you think? I was a reporter at MIT Technology Review at the time covering the cutting edge research in AI. And so at the time, OpenAI was a fundamental AI research lab and that was why I was tracking them. And what I realized was they were originally founded as a nonprofit, but they were quickly starting to develop commercial intent. They were starting to become competitive and secretive. And that had ramifications for not only the AI world, but potentially the way that AI would be introduced into society all around the world. What's your biggest concern or your, of the ramifications of that? The way that Silicon Valley and OpenAI leading the charge has really approached AI development is very much an embodiment of the way Silicon Valley has developed technology over the last decade, which is growth at all costs. They have really chosen to pursue AI models that are extraordinarily large. They require a lot of data, a lot of labor, a lot of um, computational resources, which has environmental implications. And my greatest concern is that we are pursuing a path of AI development that is extremely harmful to a lot of people around the world. In terms of jobs? In terms of jobs, in terms of their environmental health, their, uh, their ability to access economic opportunity, to access quality information. Um, and AI is a beneficial technology if we can also mitigate all of the ways that the supply chain of the current version One is worse than the other at the moment. Yeah, so there are many different types of AI technologies. But you see, is there a line at which you say to yourself, this is actually going to improve people's lives, it's going to improve productivity to a, a level where it's going to create economic efficiencies, going to create opportunities, all sorts of things? Or, is that, or do you see that that's a, sort of an, a fantasy? No, there, there's def so I think there are AI technologies that tackle very specific challenges and are well scoped that is very different from general AI technologies that are supposedly meant to do anything. Mm -hmm. If we can target AI towards problems that AI is very good for, optimization problems, um, computational problems, healthcare, healthcare um, towards integrating more renewables into the grid, these are things that AI is very good at. They are also well scoped, so it's not nebulous how you should be applying AI in that situation. But right now, these Silicon Valley companies are trying to make everything machines. And when you're trying to make everything machines, not only are they not going to be high quality in everything, people are going to have a fundamental misunderstanding about how they should be using these technologies, and inevitably it is going to harm them. Karen, you're one of a number of books that have been written about Sam Altman and OpenAI. Your book was not written with Altman's cooperation. In fact, he no. wrote something on X recently that's kind of backhanded criticism. He said, there are some books coming out about OpenAI and me. We only participated in two. No book will get everything right, especially when some people are so intent on twisting things. Uh, what happened? Why didn't he cooperate? Because you'd known him for a while. Yeah, because when I published my very first profile for MIT Technology Review, they gave me a lot of access. I embedded within the company for three days, and they were extremely uh, not happy that I drew my own conclusions. And so ever since then, I've had a very fraught relationship with the company where I've continued to do my reporting, I've continued to get insider sourcing, I've continued to really grapple with their technology because of my background. I ultimately have a really good understanding of the research and its capabilities. Um, but at, at the end of the day, OpenAI didn't want to participate in my book. What, what did you hear from insiders that concerned you that maybe they didn't like? What, what, what types of things? There are some people who say, you know, if you listen to Elon Musk or others who are very familiar with this, they think it's the equivalent of like nuclear weapons and this could end the world. Right, that's definitely a view. So one example that I heard with respect to the amount of computational resources that are now being used and the supercomputers that they have to build, one employee told me, we are running out of land and energy. The scale at which they're building the models, they actually have run out of places to put the size of the supercomputers that they need 
because there is no place in the world where utilities can deliver that much power to one location. I mean, that's been pretty well documented, the concern about getting more power, but we also yeah. have the increase in technology that seems to get better and better and better over time. So maybe there's a way to shrink the needs for the computational power. That is, I think that's exactly, you know, like when we look at other supply chains um, in history, you know, the fashion supply chain, there were plenty of challenges with the fashion industry. The solution was not to just not wear clothes, right? You still need to have fashion, but we really need right. to shore up the supply chain in order to access the benefits. I was going to ask you about the fascinating relationship that OpenAI has with Microsoft. Mm -hmm. um, some people questioning whether that partnership is fraying. The news yesterday that Elon Musk's Grok, I don't know if you saw, is now going to be in partnership with Microsoft, yeah. um, going to run on Azure. You saw Satya Nadella uh, do, doing a, effectively a a video uh, cast with Elon. That's fascinating given the <laughs> fact that Elon has been attacking OpenAI and frankly attacking Microsoft, oddly yeah. enough, for the last two years. And Sam Altman. And that's, by the way, that's not the first time that Nadella has done that. He also hired Mustafa Suleiman to right. lead Microsoft's AI efforts. And Mustafa Suleiman was a DeepMind co-founder and DeepMind was one of the original rivals of opening so okay so is that uh, unpack enemy, that my enemy is my friend or is that just <laughs> i'll work with anybody who's the best in the business at well i think that nadella has realized that putting all of his eggs in one basket with open ai is not the best strategy in part because of the blip as employees call it which was the board crisis that fired and then rehired altman in a span of five days but also because open ai doesn't necessarily have a research lead anymore in its capabilities for its models it is certainly has a lead in household name recognition, but as I talk with application developers who are using these AI models every day, they're making their models, their, their platforms, AI vendor agnostic because they don't actually think there is a clear leader anymore. And I think Nadella is a very smart so, okay, business so person. So if you were to project part. out two or three years from now, and we've got Microsoft's stock price up on the, on the screen, that, that's a company that's had a lot of success in yeah. part because of the open AI, AI relationship, this idea that it is ahead of everybody else yeah. given that relationship. What does that relationship look like? Does Microsoft and Mustafa create their own large language models? Are all these things so commoditized that they're worthless? What, what happens? They're definitely trying to develop their own in-house models. They're also trying to strike up as many partnerships as possible with other types of models so that they can all be on the Azure platform. And Microsoft can then offer to any customer that's using Azure, here are the full array of options. Pick which one's best for you. You don't use ChatGPT. Do you not use other? I do not. Uh, open source models either. Do you not use any? I don't use generative AI models that are developed by companies that I think are engaging in a lot of environmental, social, and labor harms at the moment. Do you know of any that aren't? Yeah. There are some that are more open source, that are more transparent, that are really trying to develop a better understanding. Like who are you talking about? Hugging Face, open source technology platform. Okay. They do. They don't develop their own. Gener well, sometimes they do, but they they're primarily a platform for bringing generative AI models right. onto the platform. Um, but their primary goal is to try and help people, like scientists, public researchers, policymakers, be able to understand the technology because in other environments like OpenAI and Anthropic, it's completely behind closed doors. Mm -hmm.